Hello! Happy lunch hour, and thank you for zooming into the void with the Danville Science Center, presented by presented by Danakied Associates. Uh, I'm Science Ben, Immersive Experiences Coordinator at the Danville Science Center, and your host for our tour of the night sky for October 2021. Usually during Void, we take some time to look closer at the things we see when we look up. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to take some time to explore what looks back down at us. A little bit more about that in a few moments, but we will begin today as we begin every void by taking a look outside of the Danville Science Center. Uh, we do that now within a free to use program called Stellarium. Here we are uh, directly outside the museum as we uh, near the Digital Dome Theater. We are, fo we are facing the southern sky. And if we take a few steps back, we can see that to our left is the east to our right is the west, meaning that north is directly behind us. Looking at our clock in the corner, it's just a few minutes past noon on the 12th of October, 2021. And gazing skyward, we can see that the sun is still about an hour away from its zenith, the highest point in its apparent daily travel across the sky. In about five hours, so, one, two, three, four, five, and some change. Boop, 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 boop. We can spot another object rising above the science center, Earth's lunar disk, the moon. Today's moon is in the waxing crescent phase at 47% illumination and will continue getting brighter until it reaches a full moon later into next week. As we move, as we move further into tonight's sky to just after sunset, we'll say right around seven o'clock, looking around our moon, we can spot a whole parade of planets. We can find Venus to the right of the moon and the gas giant Saturn and Jupiter to the left. On Thursday night, boom, boom, Saturn will appear even closer to the moon when it reaches lunar conjunction and Jupiter will do the same this Friday night. October is a great month for viewing planets. It is also a great time for viewing shooting stars. As we move further into the evening, let's say about uh, just after midnight, and if we look upward, we can spot some minor meteor showers. In fact, if we include all the minor meteor showers this year, this month, as well as the major, there are over eight viewing opportunities that peak in October. Most showers are best viewed in the early morning hours right before dawn. An exception is last Friday's peak of the Draconid meteor shower, minor meteor shower. The er <clears throat> The early evening hours are best for viewing it, though it could be seen throughout the night as the radiant point lies within Draco the Dragon, a circumpolar constellation that never dips below the horizon. Unfortunately, the Draconids puttered out on Sunday. Not to worry, the southern Taurids peaked Sunday and will be visible throughout the rest of the month. This shower has a low but constant rate of meteors at about five an hour. It's known for producing bright, easily spotted fireballs. This coming Monday brings the peak of the Epsilon Geminid shower, and next Thursday, the 21st, brings October's Oranid shower with a rate of 14 meteors an hour. Unfortunately, the moon's light, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the moon's light uh, will still be pretty bright at just a day past a full moon. Regardless, it will be easy to spot as Orion the Hunter is one of the easiest constellations to find um, at any time of year, October or otherwise. There is another bright light that races across the sky that is sometimes mistaken for a meteor. However, these lights are artificial. They are human made. I'm talking about satellites. <clears throat> As of January 1st, 2021, there are nearly 3,400 active satellites orbiting our planet. That is in addition to 3,200 inactive ones. Decommissioned or broken satellites are very expensive to bring back to Earth, so we just leave them there. This can make for very crowded airspace. 
hopefully providing some insight into the many reasons why launch windows are so small. In fact, the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope's successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, has yet again been delayed to the end, from the end of this month to mid-December. More on it in December's Void. Active satellites tend to orbit our planet within two different layers. 90% of all satellites travel at a distance of 160 to 2,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. This is known as Lower Earth Orbit, or LEO. It's the same orbital plane occupied by the International Space Station. On average, it takes between 90 to minutes to two hours to complete one full orbit around the Earth in LEO. The second most populous spot is at 36,000 kilometers up. Satellites here take 24 hours to make planetary orbit. That's why this plane is known as Geosynchronous Earth Orbit, or GEO. While it takes objects in GEO longer to orbit, their position also allows them to, server, to survey a greater area of Earth. Satellites in GEO are constantly in field of view of one-third the planet's surface. Artificial satellites are used for navigation, communications, national defense, and weather predicting. In short, human-made satellites are scientific instruments used to collect data about our planet. Perhaps the most widely utilized collection of data comes from the nearly 50 years of global observation conducted as the Landsat mission. In 1966, the United States Geological Survey proposed a satellite to study Earth's land masses. In 1972, Landsat 1 was launched into orbit from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Landsat 1 was the very first collection of digital data of Earth. It repeated at regular intervals with geometric fidelity, allowing for comparison between observations. As a result, this changed how we drew maps, calculated food production, and assessed natural disasters. Landsat 2 launched in 1975, doubling the amount of data being collected. Three years later, Landsat 3 launched to replace an aging Landsat 1. The 1980s brought new technology aboard Landsat 4. It possessed the thematic mapper instrument, which collected light at seven different wavelengths, including three visible bands of red, green, and blue, allowing for natural color composite images of Earth. The addition of shortwave infrared light meant data that could better highlight flooded areas, mineral deposits, and burn scars from wildfires. Landsat 5 also included a thematic mapper when it launched in 1984. The launch of Landsat 6 didn't go quite so well, October 5th, 1993. Landsat 6 separated from the Titan II launch vehicle it was attached to, but an explosion in its liquid fuel system due to a ruptured hydrazine manifold resulted in catastrophic failure. Landsat 6 failed to reach orbit. A redesign was needed. Landsat 7 launched in 1999 with a quote, with a quote safe and failure-free hydrazine feed system in addition to the new Enhanced Thermal Mapper Plus. This resulted in the most stable Earth observation instrument ever sent into orbit. It could even be calibrated and updated while in space. Landsat 7 began the mapping of coral reefs, the first high-res natural color map of Antarctica, and allowed states to gauge how much water was used by crops, resulting in more efficient water usage. In 2008, as a result of the Department of the Interior's open data policy, the USGS made all Landsat information free and available to download to the public, unlocking a ton of innovation and $2 billion a year in economic benefits. 2013 saw the launch of the Landsat 8, which utilizes a push broom style sensor. This advancement and partnering with two European Sentinel-2 satellites allows for observations to be collected every two or three days instead of every two weeks. Two weeks ago, on September 27th, the Landsat 9 reached its orbit. In addition to economic, agricultural, and cardi cardiographic contributions, the Landsat mission continues to be perhaps the most useful instrument for tracking the effects of climate change now and into the future. The USGS reports that more than 100 million Landsat scenes have been downloaded since becoming publicly available in 2008. So how do you get your hands on this sweet, sweet data? NASA and the United States Geological Survey host a variety of websites that can be used to explore Landsat datasets. Here at the Science Center, we enjoy Earth Explorer, which can be found at earthexplorer.usgs.gov. It's a fun way to explore Danville from a bird's eye view, a very high flying bird's eye view. You perhaps might enjoy an even more user-friendly experience presented through a little app called Google Earth. 
Google Earth. Google Earth translates, translates Landsat data into three-dimensional objects, permitting for realistic topographic survey, resulting in a very fun way to view your house from space. In April, the company announced the release of Google Earth 3D Time Lapse. This function will use the five decades of Landsat collections to allow users like you or me to observe how Earth has changed from 1984 to 2020, permitting personal evaluation of the effects of climate change. Director of Google Earth, Rebecca Moore, said at release, it's best for a landscape view of our world. It's not about zooming in, it's about zooming out. It's about taking the big step back. We need to see how our home is doing. Time-lapse is currently available in Google Earth and can be assessed via the Voyager tab. Finally, we return to tonight's sky to uh, celebrate the return of the winter constellations. Uh, we do that, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of these meteors so we get a better view. And we're actually gonna go even further into the night, let's say about 3 a.m. for you early risers. And we can spot one of my favorite winter constellations, mighty Taurus the Bull, returning to the night sky along with the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades in his shoulder. Taurus is joined by his hunting, by his, um, uh, by Orion the Hunter. Orion the Hunter and Taurus the Bull are forever engaged in battle. Orion is uh, able to appear above the horizon now that his mortal enemy, Scorpio the Scorpion, has descended past the horizon. Orion doesn't go anywhere without his faithful hunting companions, Canis Major and Canis Minor, his hunting dogs, which again we can see now above the horizon and throughout the rest of winter. We don't want you to be left alone with any of your lingering science questions. <clears throat> any of your lingering science questions. There we go. Uh, which you can share with us about space, uh, particularly during Void. We invite you now, tomorrow, whenever, to submit them to the Danville Science Center's Facebook page for a chance to receive a response live during Void. This month's question comes from Deshaun. He asks, why don't constellations look like anything? How are a bunch of dots supposed to make up a fish? Thank you for your question, Deshaun. First, we have to remember that many of the most well-known constellations were named several hundred years ago. There wasn't much to entertain people back then once the sun went down, so they would go outside and look up at the stars, weaving stories about people, animals, and mythological beasts that were important to their community. Patterns of stars were used as illustrations to assist in the telling of these stories, illustrations and stories that we continue to tell to this day. Thank you for your question and thank you for joining us today for this month's Void presented by Danakid Associates. We look forward to your joining us for next for our next virtual online interstellar discussion the second Tuesday of November, November 9th, one week after my birthday. Until then, stay healthy, stay safe, and of course, stay curious. Goodbye. <laughs>